Hello, I'm Dan, and this is Dan Explains. If you click on this video, you've probably heard of string theory before. It, of course, should be called string theories, because there are several. When people say string theory these days, they're probably referring to M-theory, which combines them together. Anyway, for M-theory to work and be correct, the universe needs 11 dimensions. 10 of space and 1 of time. Of course, it's obvious apparent that there are three dimensions of space, yet physicists and cosmologists continue to entertain the idea of M-theory. Why? Well, let me explain why. First off, this is the third video in a short series I'm doing on the possible origin for the universe. The other two are linked in the description, but aren't required to understand this one, so you can go ahead and watch them after this video. My next video is going to tie them all up and provide a possible answer for the ideas I present in this one. String theory came about when people noticed that particles like electrons could be represented mathematically as vibrational nodes on a string. If you've ever played around with swishing a string back and forth, you'll notice once you hit a certain frequency that the peaks and the troughs of the string no longer appear to travel but just go up and down in place. This is called a standing wave. String theory postulated that there are one-dimensional strings and particles are basically standing wave vibrations in those strings. Well, an issue with this turned out to be that these vibrations only seem to match with reality if you added dimensions to the universe. The particular zoo of particles you got depended on how many dimensions you added. This got boiled down by Edward Witten in 1995 into M-theory, which says there are 10 spatial dimensions. The issue, of course, is, well, there seems to be only three. To solve this problem, physicists propose the extra seven spatial dimensions we seem to be missing are just really tiny, so they are too tiny for us to see them or travel them in any amount of distance, but big enough that these strings could vibrate in them. To get this to work, you'd have to be able to fold the dimensions up somehow into a shape. This is called compactification, because the extra dimensions are getting compactified into spaces too small for us to perceive. The extra dimensions could either be open or closed. Open dimensions are basically dimensions that don't repeat, and closed dimensions are ones that do. The best analogy I've seen to explain what these little dimensions may look like and why we can't see them is this. Imagine a cloth is a two-dimensional representation of our universe. If you are a two-dimensional person sewn into the cloth, you would not be able to observe the cloth's thickness. Now that cloth would be an open compactified dimension because it would have size to it, aka boundaries. For a compactified closed example, let's talk about the same cloth from a different perspective. If you look at it really closely, it's made of tiny threads. Although our two-dimensional person can travel along the length of the threads, the circumference of the threads are too tiny for our person to traverse it. If he was small enough to do that, he would go around the thread and end up back where he started. That's why it's a closed dimension, because traversing that dimension brings you in a closed loop. Now the shape of the compactified dimensions doesn't have to be a circle. In fact, most theorists seem to favor a weird shape called a Caleb Yao manifold. No, I'm not going to try to describe it, but as you can see, it doesn't look simple. This picture is actually the one Wikipedia uses as the icon representing string theory on Wikipedia. So, the cloth example is pretty good because it's also a good analogy for how the universe and everything in it could be made of strings that jiggle in the higher dimensions. Since a cloth appears to be a two-dimensional sheet until you examine it closely and see it's made of tiny three-dimensional strings. Of course, the strings in string theory are one-dimensional, but you can wind them around the extra dimensions, kind of like the curly hair around a curling iron. String theory hasn't been proven yet, but people have been trying to think of ways of detecting these tiny dimensions. One way is to try and probe them with gravity. Gravity gets weaker the further from the body you get. The drop-off in its strength is described by the inverse square law that 2 and the equation has to do with the number of dimensions. So, if the universe was two-dimensional, like my Lowe's example of gravity, it would fall off linearly instead. You can probably see where I'm going with this now. In higher dimensional spaces, you can just plug in the dimension number, which means the gravity will drop off much faster. How do you use it to find tiny dimensions? 
Well, if you use a particle accelerator to smash particles together super hard, you can create a tiny black hole. You may remember some years ago when there was a big controversy with the LHC that it might be able to create tiny black holes people thought might swallow the Earth. If you watched my last video, you'll know why that wouldn't be an issue. At any rate, the LHC would only be powerful enough to do that if the tiny dimensions proposed in string and M theory are big enough. It needs the extra oomph of the increasing dimension number to make it possible. They haven't seemed to found any tiny black holes at this point, but that doesn't mean string theory is incorrect. The question that comes to mind when thinking about these tiny dimensions is, why they aren't large like the others? How did they get so small? Well, that's a question for my next video. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please press the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ding the bell to get notified when I post new videos. Also, please support me on Patreon. Link in the description. The more people who support me, the more time I can dedicate to making videos like this one. So, until next time, have a great week.